notice that in our transform palette, our fields, our active fields, our keyframe fields, I should say, have turned yellow. Yet again, the transform palette really, really comes in handy. It's very nice. Now we know exactly that we are on a keyframed uh, frame, that there's activity there. And if I move just one frame off, or a couple of frames off, um, they, they are no longer yellow, but they're green. So we know that we're in we're in territory that's been keyframed at some point, but we're not on a keyframe until we hit the keyframe right there. Did that with an arrow key. Uh, right there, now it's yellow, so we know we're actually on a keyframe. Just pointing that out. Now we're going to send that camera right past the text, if we can. I sort of can, except that I'm at a really weird angle to move something along a Z, Z axis, axis, so I'm going to do it with the numbers up here in my transform palette, and I told you. So how far should we send it back? Well, there are two ways to tell. We know that um, the text itself is at roughly 1.2 Z axis index, Z index. Um, so we know that if we get that camera past that point, then we'll be we're basically like right past the text right now. Of course, we can also just eyeball it in the camera view. So it just really kind of depends on on how your views are and, and how much stuff you've got going on. But this is pretty good. Um, this also means that the moment we start z zooming back in our animation, we'll have text, which may or may not be what you want, because maybe you want to fly through space a little while. Um, so knowing your numbers, very important, very handy. We'll give ourselves a little bit of time, a little bit of time out in space, not much. I'm happy with this. I'm going to hit I for insert location. I'm not going to hit the insert for rotation because you, you never know. I might want to manipulate that later on. So now if I go to the camera view and um, let's shorten our playback amount. We've only got, we go up to what, 77 frames? So let's go down here to our end point, right down here in our playback bar, and we'll slide it down to, I don't know, 87 frames. That sounds good. Once again, just kind of arbitrarily decided, because that's where my mouse ended up. And now I'm going to hit Alt-A to play the animation. It's pretty good. Now, you're probably noticing right away that we don't get any of those fancy lighting effects that we spent so much time designing for ourselves. And that's it's quite true. We don't. Um, hit Alt-A to stop it again. The reason for that is because we haven't learned how to render out to to a movie yet, right? We, we've, we, we can render single frames. We know how to do that with F12, but we can't... we, we don't know how to do a, a, a complete video yet. Well, we're going to learn that. But first, let's add another element. Why not? Um, so we've got a basic pullback right here. That's what's kind of going on. We can see that in the camera view. And it looks good. We're okay with that. You know, we could we could always do a couple of touch-ups with... Um, trying to find my camera. Here we go. Um, we, could, we could do a couple of touch-ups on our easing out and easing in graph view. We could we could try for that sort of thing. I, I don't think I want to do too much with that. I guess I really probably do though. So there you go. Uh, that should be a little bit of an ease out. Remember that if you make the curve um, more, I guess, obtuse, that's not probably the right term, but if you if you make your your curve wider, then the result is going to be, at least w uh, towards the end point, the result is that it's going to take the object longer to get to that point because it's going uphill and it has to go over that last hump and then it meets its end point. So, and, and that's that's always, you know, physically that always looks right to people. It, things should slow down before they stop. That's what people like. Unless you're trying to do like a slam cut sort of thing where you just, you want to hit people with, with yes, we've stopped and then there's gravity and weight. 
there are other ways to do that in Blender too, but that would be a time that you probably wouldn't want to modify that. But let's let's go ahead and add yet another element here. So the Slackware logo for the, the Linux distribution that I use, Slackware logo, happens to be a an S with a, a blue circle with an S in, in front of it, on it, whatever. So let's get a circle mesh, uh, shift A to bring up our add menu mesh, uh, and then we'll, we'll grab a cylinder. Looks like a cylinder to me. Um, it's going to need to be a lot thinner, although not really because we're going to look dead on at it, but I, I would feel better if it was, if it was thinner, more like a coin size or so. So we could try to grab onto it with our edit tool, but look at how many points there are there. That's just, uh, kind of crazy. Happily, there are, there, there is the transform palette still, and there's this dimensions thing, and it's got a setting for the Z dimension. So we can just squash it down really nice and easy, just that quickly. Of course, we need it to be, um, blue, like I say, and we also need it to be behind that S. So we're going to need it to be a bit smaller. So I'm pressing S to get it a little bit smaller, although I'm not sure if I'm close enough to be all that precise. So middle mouse button, of course, if you'll recall, moves my stage around. And I can move everything. I can move around stuff with my middle mouse button. Shift middle mouse to do stage. I think I misspoke. Um, so that's still a bit uh, large. That looks about right. That's pretty good. It's pretty pretty spot on, at least from this angle. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. So that's seven number key to see it kind of from that top down view. Let's get some uh, some color shading on that, and that's of course in the materials tab. It's a blue circle um, officially. That's the the logo that they use, and I'm having a really hard time finding a good blue, but there we go, getting there, getting there, ah, too purple, that's good, that's perfect right there, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually pretty good, I like that, uh, now, it would be boring, of course, to just do a simple pull out, right? I mean, oops. no one wants to uh, just see a simple pull out with with no real animation going on. So instead, we will switch back to our top view. So instead, let's let's have some other thing happening in this in this wonderful animation, and we might as well have that blue disc meet us at, at the end frame. So I'm going to maneuver. First of all, I'm going to select my camera because that is the defining factor in this animation. So there's my camera. I see that I have keyframes. I'm going to find those keyframes, which is on 77. Okay. So I'm just confirming that I'm on the keyframe frame. Now I'm going to zoom in a little bit with my mouse wheel. I'm going to right click on the disc and I'm going to, of course, insert a keyframe. And again, I'm going to do a location and a rotation. Ah, who cares? And scale. Why not? So we've got a couple of things about that now keyframed. So at the beginning, we need that disk to be somewhere other than its, um, than its end point. And I, I don't really care where it's going to come from as long as it doesn't come from above and move through the S. That might look a little bit weird, like like that would be weird. But if we move it way back into the background, that could be interesting. Um, and we could even possibly move it a little bit off to the side. I, I'm a little bit nervous about that, but um, let's move it up a little bit. There. So we've moved it up and back. And we are going to set a keyframe now. I. Location. I guess I didn't modify the rotation after all, but that's okay. So, um, I don't know. Let's see what we got. Uh, if we do a camera view again, 
we're at frame zero. Okay, so Alt A to um, actually let's get our little selector off of that object because seeing that 3D information is kind of annoying after a while. So okay, so that's going to be our first frame. We we may or may not be okay with that. I mean the blue disc floating in the background. We might be fine with that. I really don't know. But Alt A would of course start. And there you go. You got a little bit of movement in there. Uh, like I say, it's not the fanciest thing, not the fanciest slate in the world, but it's 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 not horrible either. So go back out here. I'm kind of curious as to uh, if we go to um, the 77th frame or so. It's pretty good, and then render just that frame. Yeah, it looks like there's going to be some interplay with lighting on that on that disc as well. Now, if you'll recall, and, and again, I, I, I haven't exactly tried all of the stuff that I'm talking about here with this setup. This is just kind of something I'm doing for, for, this, for this, this episode. So we might as well experiment a little bit. So here's the lamp. If you'll recall, properties, lamp, there's the preview. That's the kind of lamp it is. That's all great. But remember that by default, there's no shadows being cast by this lamp might be interesting to say, let's go ahead and cast some shadows with this lamp and see if we, if we, if we get some interesting, you know, stuff happening on that blue disc. Might be kind of fun to, to see how that goes. Okay, so I'm going to at this point save because now we've done just way too much work not to save this thing. So we'll do this as the uh, slacker slate. And we'll save that. So now we've saved it. That's always a good thing to do. We could even, I don't know, I'm feeling adventurous. I'm going to say let's add a little bit of mist, just a touch of mist. I, I find that a little bit of mist uh, sometimes kind of adds a, a layer of uh, tangibility. So we've got that going on now. I guess I'll go ahead and save that again there. Um, and now let's go ahead and render this thing see it in a proper movie player instead of just our camera views. <laughs> 